Good morning. I am so glad to be here today. I missed you guys. I don't know if you guys know, uh, but I was gone last week. Anybody notice? I was in uh, I was in uh, Rwanda, and it was a uh, um, amazing time. Um, we'll have a chance over the next uh, next couple of weeks to share a little bit more with you about it, especially once the team returns. Uh, most of the team is still traveling right now. Just me and Bob came back yesterday, so I could be here for for service this morning. Uh, but it was just a great, great trip, and uh, God was God was gracious to us. And uh, we just saw God move, and it was just neat. I, I honestly like. I would encourage if you can go to the go on the trip, um, really any any of the trips, but specifically the trip to Rwanda. I would encourage you to do it. And what what an opportunity to stand with. Um, brothers and sisters in Christ, united by the gospel in just an incredible way. Completely different culture, completely different context, but the same spirit and the same Lord that bound us together. Um, I, have, I have true brothers and sisters there, and, uh, um, and so do you. And so I would encourage you, if you ever get a chance to go, it is, it is, it is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. If you have your Bibles, you can open me to Hebrews chapter 13. Uh, we're continuing our series entitled Shadows of Studying the Book of Hebrews. And we are entering the very last chapter of the book. I don't know if you guys know this. We've been doing this for a few months, and uh, um, we're coming to, to coming to the end. So I think so. I think it's a good time uh, to remind you of the overarching theme that has been revealed in this book that we've been focusing in on for these many months. The entire thrust is that Jesus is better. Jesus, Jesus, the, Jesus the prophet is better than Moses the prophet. Jesus, the leader, is better than Joshua, the leader. Jesus, the high priest, is better than Aaron, the high priest. Jesus, the sacrificial lamb of God, is better than the sacrificial lamb of the tabernacle. And as a result, the new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ is greater than the old covenant that was done in the the blood of goats and lamb. This is the entire theme. The entire story has been Jesus is better. So the entire book has been meant to teach us that Jesus is better. And I love reminding you of this fact as we enter the last chapter because that theme continues into this chapter. That theme continues into this message. And I, and, and I, would, and I would argue uh, today as we get into this morning's text, it continues in a way that expands the scope of Jesus' superiority. That, that, that doesn't just talk about it in the context of the New or the Old Testament. It just talk about it in the context of what we read in the Old Testament. But it shows that Jesus Christ is superior, period, to all that this world has. Let's look at the text. This begins in chapter 13, verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and, and those, those who were mistreated since you were in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money, and be constant with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? This passage covers, covers a lot of ground, but ultimately it lands in one truth. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Would you join me in prayer as we pray for God's blessing on his word? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to come into your presence. We thank you for the opportunity to come into your presence as the body of Christ and hear your word. I pray that each one of us, as we are here this morning, would allow your word to penetrate our hearts, penetrate our minds, penetrate our spirits, and penetrate our lives. That we would not be as ones who who look into the mirror and go away unchanged, but that your word would change us. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. I got a gift this last Christmas from my brother. Uh, And it was one of of those updated plug-in Atari systems. Right? How many, how many guys, like, that was, like, your first, your first video game systems, the Atari systems? See, I'm old enough. That was it. 
And it's funny because it's one of those that you plug in, and, you know, when I was a kid, it, you had the cartridges. So, you you know, one game, and you wanted to play Asteroids, or you wanted to play Pong, or you wanted, you wanted to play Space Invaders, you'd pull them out, right? This one's one of those systems that has all of them on there. So, I don't know, there's something like 78,000 78, or something, I don't know, it's some, like, ridiculous number of games that are on there. But there's just a certain ones that you played, and so when I was a kid growing up, the, one of the games that we played all the time was Space Invaders. How many people play Space Invaders? Like, very simplistic game, right? But it is an extremely addicting game. And, you know, it's got all the guys lined up, and they kind of march towards you, moving back and forth. And you're going back and forth, hiding behind the little 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 shields to try and shoot down the game. And it's funny because as I, as I got this game, and we were playing, I was playing the game recently, I, the, like, the sensation of, of playing this game when I was a kid all kind of returns. Because there's something really, there's something about Space Invaders in particular, at least in my experience, uh, that is very, um, it's become very visceral for me. Space Invaders starts out really simple, doesn't it? You know, you got the game, and they're, they're moving kind of slow, and it's got this thing here, and you kind of go behind, shoot this guy, shoot that guy, shoot this guy, shoot that guy, shoot this guy. You got to do it systematically. You take the first row out, you take the second row out, you take the third row out, right? Because you, you don't want to get out like one side, because these guys over here are going to get down closer, and they're going to get you. And it's, you start out, and it's a very simple thing. And then you clear, you clear one board, and then the next board comes, and what happens? It gets faster, right? And then you clear the second board, and the third board comes, and it's even faster. And when I was a kid, and, and, I, and I re-experienced this coming, coming back out of Christmas, when I was a kid, I always got to a certain point, and I just couldn't stink and beat that level, right? Because it just kept coming at you faster and faster and faster, and I just couldn't. And then there was always that one jerk, that one jerk alien that would come across, right? Whoop, 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 whoop. And then they would drop a bomb on you. You're concentrating on the fast guys moving towards you, and then all of a sudden he drops that bomb on you. And I'm st- and I'm at that point, like like I've hit I've hit the level I can't play anymore, and it's just frustrating because I because I can get up to a certain point and it just keeps coming at me so fast. It's coming at me so fast. So many things I got to hit. So many things I got to do. So many things I got that I just can't do it. And so what I want to do is I want to pull it out of the wall and throw my controller. <laughs> I tell you this story because I wonder if some of us ever feel like your Christianity is like that. Where, 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 there, are, where there are dozens, seemingly hundreds of commands and instructions and do's and don'ts and, and disciplines marching at, towards you at a consistent pace. And sometimes they seem to be increasing their pace, getting to the point where it feels overwhelming. And then you come to church on a Sunday morning, and the preacher drops suffering children in Africa or, or, or struggling church in India on you like, like that rogue alien dropping a guilt bomb. And it makes you, you want to unplug and just kind of throw the controller. It, it all starts out, it seems, in our Christian faith really simple. But then you just keep hearing more things and more things, and I got to do this, and I got to do that, and I got to do this, and I got to do that. And eventually, you, you, you lose the ability, you lose the ability to handle it. To a certain degree, I feel like this morning's text has the potential to create that kind of anxiety. It says, "Let brotherly love continue." And for all of us, we sit there and say, "Yep, that's important. I, I need to love my brother. Show hospitality to strangers." Yeah, yeah, that's right. I need to show hospitality to strangers. Don't forget those in prison. Oh, yeah, I, I always forget that one. How do I help the people in prison? How do I get there and do that? And, and, and those that are mistreated, don't forget those who are mistreated. Okay, who, who is that again? Who would that be? And then it says, watch your marriage. And, 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 don't, be sexually, uh, and don't be sexually immoral. And don't be greedy. Learn to be content even. So, so in, the, in the span of five verses, we, we get eight related and, 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 and not so related instructions in how to live our lives. And really, they're challenging, destruct, uh, they're challenging instructions on how to live our lives. There's all these different things in there, and it's about selflessness, about giving of ourselves and do this and do that and do this and do that. For many of us, if we do four or five of these things consistently, you'd feel pretty good about yourself, wouldn't you? But it just seems like, like the, the, the calls, the challenges, the do's, the don'ts kind of pile up. And as I say, the, the, even this, they're, they're, they're some of the greatest challenges we'll ever face because at the heart of what they're calling us to is selflessness. How many of you guys just 
have discovered that your, your, your greatest weakness is selflessness. Most of us, most of us are, 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 are built to be selfish. Show hospitality to strangers. Visit prisoners. Identify and help the suffering. Deny sexual desires that lead to sexual immorality. Avoid greed while embracing contentment. Each one of these is about being selfless and engaging in self-denial. And that challenge for us as human beings is pretty significant. Each one of these is rooted in dying to self. And it's not the kind of thing that we do naturally. It's not the kind of thing we do easily. How many of you are with me when I say that this challenge of self-denial is probably the, the greatest challenge of the Christian walk? Dying to self. And, and, this is, and what we're reading here is, is this is the finish line of the book. This is the finish line of the book. Meaning we've already run a course where the author of Hebrews has dropped into our consciousness a number of spiritual callings and responsibilities that we're asked to fulfill. This isn't, this isn't the total of the list. You go all the way through the book and, and time and time again, we're told to do this and to do that. Throughout the book, he's, he's told us to watch carefully our doctrine and turn to Christ when we are tempted. We're told to hold our confidence and to exhort one another daily. We're told to be united in faith, to serve to strive to receive his word, to hold fast on our confession and to enter the throne of grace. He tells us to mature in our faith, leave the elementary doctrines of Christ behind, to stir one another up to love and good works, to meet together, to encourage encourage one another. We're told to stop sinning. We're told to lay aside sin that weighs us down. We're told to run with endurance the race ahead, strengthen those who are weak, strive for peace, to root out bitterness. And then we land at 13, and there's, and there's eight more things we're told to do. In 13 chapters, there are 26 instructions on how to live, what to do, what not to do. And this is just in one book, right? It's just one book, the entire Bible. We begin to work our way through the other, other books. There's other stuff that comes up, isn't there? Now, this can seem overwhelming. But it only becomes overwhelming when you lose sight of the backdrop, when you lose sight of the context, when you, when you, when you, when you miss the, the environment, the, the relationship within these challenges that are laid before us. See, see these, things, these things are told to us as a list. It's not, just, it's not just handed to us on a list and say, here's what you do. There's great context around it. There's a great story around it that you have to see. You see, too often, our view of faith, the, the world's view of Christian faith, and even too often, the church's view of Christian faith, is this list of requirements we have, a list of instructions we have. A list of do's and don'ts. And so often they're disconnected from the beautiful context of the glorious, gracious, sufficient, abundant work of Jesus Christ. And when that takes place, it it, it does become overwhelming. Honestly, that is the beauty of the book of Hebrews. I walked through the entire book, and I drew from the entire book 26 different related and unrelated instructions, directions, requirements. And and when you focus in on them, they seem overwhelming. I just walked through it with you, and I gave you list after list after list after list of things that we're supposed to do and things we're not supposed to do. But the beauty of this book, the beauty of this morning's text, and really the beauty of the entirety of Christian faith is that these are a small part. These are a small part of the story set among the great majesty of the knowledge of the work and relationship we have in Jesus Christ. Yeah, there are 26 different instructions, challenges to the believers in the pages of this book. But you know what? They're but a fraction 
of the revelations that are found in this book. The author of the book of Hebrews actually brings us on this incredible, majestic journey into the beauty of Jesus Christ. When you, when you total all of the verses I, I had to go to so that, so that I could pull out these 26 mandates, you could take all those verses and total them up, and they might equal an average chapter in this book. One chapter. One chapter out of 13 chapters. Do you know what the rest of the book tells us? About the work of Jesus Christ about the majesty of Jesus Christ, about the glory of Jesus Christ, about the relationship we have in Jesus Christ, about who he is. What is asked of us makes up less than 10% of the book because the other 90% is devoted to trying to get you to see who Christ is and what he has given to us. And the reason for that is because that is what Christianity is. That's what it is to be a Christian, coming to the undeniable, mind-blowing reality of the majesty of Jesus Christ and the depths of his gracious work. The fixation we have on the do's and the don'ts wipes away the depth of what our Christian faith is supposed to be about. Whether it's in, it's in chapter 1 where, where he is described as the radiance of the glory of God who upholds the universe, but who has also made the purification for our sins by his sacrifice. Or in chapter 2 where we are told that although all things were subject to him, yet by the grace of God he tasted death for us. And that he is the most perfect high priest because he became the propitiation, because he became the replacement for our sins. In chapter 3, we're told he is ever faithful. In chapter 4, we're told Jesus was tempted like us but didn't sin, so he sympathizes with us in our struggling so we can feel free to draw near to him and receive grace. Chapter 5 tells us, Jesus lifted up loud prayers in tears, accepting suffering so that he might be our eternal salvation. Now, do you hear this? That's in five chapters. That's in five chapters. Lay that against the different, the different instructions and different, different callings and the different challenges and, and the different do's and don'ts that I read. And it's almost nothing, isn't it? The entire book spends most of its focus on the incredible nature of Jesus Christ and his working on behalf of our salvation. I'm giving you this overview because it is essential to understanding the passage we just read. And I think it's, it's essential to, to understanding the book we have been studying. But even more importantly, it is essential in understanding what Christianity truly is. And how it is that we find the strength to live out that which we are called to live out. What I'm saying is this. When we focus on, on the few trees of spiritual responsibility, and we lose sight of the majestic forest of Christ's enduring gospel work, we will lose our way. We will lose our way on our spiritual journey, and we will arrive at a point of frustration instead of abiding joy. In other words, the problem most people have with Christianity, whether, whether you're, you're, you're a committed follower or someone who has abandoned their faith or someone who has never been willing to explore it, is that we become fixated on what we are supposed to do and not do instead of keeping our focus on what is the great story of the Christian faith, the great gospel work of Jesus. And it's from that fixation, it's from that investment in the beauty of Jesus Christ that we receive the ability, we receive the power to step into the responsibilities, into the calling, into the do's and don'ts, and be able to live it out. It's in being fixated on him that we have that ability. That is what this morning's text is revealing to us. 
See, we can easily become fixated on the list of do's and don'ts. We can, we can become fixated on the list that is found between Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. But in doing that, you're focusing on the trees and you're missing the forest. And I will tell you, most likely you will fail in trying to accomplish the trees. This list is sandwiched between two declarations from the author of Hebrews that are intended to be the link pen for living this out. He's saying this is how we do this. This is why we do this. The first declaration is found in the last verses of chapter 12. And the second is found in the last verse of this morning's text. In Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 28 through 29, it says this, Therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to stranger, for, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in, in prison with them, and those who are mistreated since you, were, since you are also in the body. And then in chapter 13, the second half of verse 6, it says this, For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And I want you guys to realize that the two declarations, the declaration that, that God has given us a, an unshakable kingdom, and the declaration that he will never leave you nor forsake you, are sandwiched around the list of what could be seen as the list of do's and don'ts. And what happens in the first declaration leads into the list, and the other comes out of the list. But they both teach us how we can live out the do's and don'ts by focusing on the glorious gospel work of Jesus Christ and not on the list. Let me show you what I mean. See the first section. Hebrews chapter 12, 28 through 13, verse 3, shows us how. It shows us how the impact of the grace of Christ towards us inspires grace towards others. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to stranger. Who, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and, and who, who are mistreated, since you are also in the body. Now the first half of the list introduce, introduces to us what? Proactive expression of God's grace and love toward the hurting, toward those who are in need, toward those who are broken. And where does it flow out of? Where, where does that instruction, where does that direction flow out of? It flows out of us being called to respond in acceptable worship to the fact that God has given us an unshakable kingdom. The phrase simply means, unshakable kingdom simply means that we have been given salvation by the gracious work of Jesus Christ. So he says, because you've been given this kingdom, because you've been given this salvation, respond with acceptable worship, and that acceptable worship leads into what? Let brotherly love abound. Help those who are hurting. Invite those who, are, who have no homes. Take care of those who are in need. Encourage those who are mistreated. Visit people in prison. He's saying, listen, when you understand, when you see, when you are gripped by the reality that you've been given the unshakable kingdom, there is a worshipful response to that reality. You have been given the unshakable kingdom. You have been given salvation through Jesus Christ. What are the implications of our status in that transaction? In that, in that giving of salvation, in that, in, that, in, that, in, that being, in that giving of redemption, what's our status in that? What were we before the grace of God through the work of Jesus Christ was extended to us? We were hurting. We were needy. 
we were the broken, right? We were the homeless. We, we were the ones who were the beggars. We were the strangers in need of the hospitality of Christ. We were imprisoned by our sin. But the grace of Jesus Christ expressed through his willingness to die a horrific death on the cross visited us in that state so that we might receive redemption. And his resurrection from the dead gave us entry into the unshakable kingdom of our God. Where there is comfort for the brokenhearted, where there is peace for the afflicted, where there is home for those who are homeless. This is the gift we've been given. And he says, respond in acceptable worship. Let brotherly love reign. Visit prisoners. Take care of those who have no home. Help those who are mistreated. This is one of the lessons that I learn every single time I go to Rwanda and I work with Salus Ministries. Salus Ministries is an incredible ministry. And, and every time I go there, this is the lesson I learn specifically from their leaders. People like John Kwandi and Mama Lambert and, and Francois Javier. See, Salas Ministries was birthed in, in, the, in the wake of the genocide. And it was started by John Kwandi, who lost 80 members of his family to the genocide. And, and John was this close on two different occasions of dying himself. He had a gun pointed at his head. And they were about to pull the trigger, and the man recognized John as the man who had helped him in his sickness. And looked at him and said, you will not die today. And let him walk away. John Kwandi, on the, on, the, on, the, on the heels of the genocide, the Holy Spirit moved on his heart. And he looked in Isaiah. And Isaiah said, comfort my people. And so he purposed in his heart, out of, the, out of, the, out of what the, the work that God had done in him. The work that God had done in him in the wake of the genocide. And the way in which God was his salvation. In which God was his strength. He decided to step out and be one who would comfort others in response to what God did to him. And one of the first people he came across was Mama Lambert. Mama Lambert, who had been raped, whose husband was killed, who watched two of her children be killed. In the wake of the genocide, she was, she was, in, she was so, and so bitter and so angry. They said she would, she'd wake up at night, she'd grab a bat and she'd go into the bars and she'd beat up drunk men who were a part of the genocide. She said that she didn't sleep a single, she couldn't sleep through the night because every time she would close her eyes, she would see the images of her rape and she would see the images of people being killed. John Quandy found Mama Lambert in this situation and, and responding to the grace of God in his life sat down with her, and she just shared her story. And he wept with her, and he put his arm around her. And that night, for the first time since the genocide, she slept through the night. In fact, her neighbors came to look for her because they thought she might be dead. So Mama Lambert, out of that experience, she stepped in, and my goodness, what a woman of God. The number of times I sat and watched her with her arms around a widow sharing her story of rape, sharing her story of seeing somebody, somebody snatched from her life, holding her as she weeps because of the redemption of Jesus Christ in her heart and in her life. She's responding. And this is the ministry you see all the time as you step into that place. The number of times I've sat and watched the minister at their centers, as people share the most horrific of testimonies. And you watch as, as they minister to the members of missions teams like ours. I've sat and watched the victims of rape bring comfort 
to the victims of rape on our missions teams. And I've seen them receive healing. I've watched as people whose family members have been ripped from them as a result of the genocide comfort those who have lost loved ones from our missions team and see them receive healing. You see, one of the most amazing things to me about this is these people who went through so much and received grace and mercy from God to find healing. When they hear of your pain and your suffering, they rush to you to encourage you, to help you find healing. This is what takes place in our lives when our fixation is on the work of Jesus Christ in our lives instead of the things we have to do or don't do. We see his grace towards us and we extend grace towards others. If you are struggling to answer the call of proactive grace to the hurting around you, it is because the impact of God's grace hasn't gripped you. And this is a problem that won't be corrected by fixating on trying harder. It will only find life in you when you are fixated on the grace of God toward you. It is, it is looking into the full face of Jesus Christ as he hangs on the cross, as blood drips down his face, to see the nail scars in his hands, how he has given to you and given to you and given to you. The natural response when that catches your heart, catches your life, and you realize that you've been the recipient of his grace is to give grace to others. Don't worry about the do's or don'ts until you've been undone by the grace of Jesus Christ. Press into that truth. Press into that reality and see how the life you live will change as a result of it. Then you look at the second half of the list. And you discover that that half is not about extending grace towards others, but about self-control and self-denial. But in this case, as in the first, you discover it's not about fixating on the list, but it is about fixating on the gospel work of Jesus. Just as the impact of the grace of God toward us inspires us to be gracious towards others, The conviction of Christ's provision inspires us to not seek provision in the things of the flesh. You look again at how the verses lay out. As it was on the first point, on the second point, the revelation of the gospel work of Jesus affects our lives. Particularly in the case, it, it is looking at the depths of Christ's provision that influences our life responses. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let marriage be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Now, why should you do that? For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What are you seeing here? What you're seeing here is just as in the first, the the, the understanding of who Jesus Christ is, the understanding of, of the work of Jesus Christ inspires you to not have to seek after the things of this world. Listen, it's not about what I feel. It's not about what I get. It's not about the money I have. It's that he is always with me. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. He is my helper. One, one commentary describes that, 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 that word that it's used that translates helper like this. It says, it, it, it is one who runs to assist you upon hearing your cry for help. This is the promise of who Jesus Christ is. This is the promise of who he is. He is the one who runs to our side. He is the one who is walking with us constantly. And when we understand that, when that that grips us, as a result of, of being gripped by that reality, 
we should not, and, and more than that, we need not indulge actions that testify to everyone that our joy, our fulfillment, our completion is in something other than Jesus Christ. Do you see how it works? See what they're saying? Listen, you don't have to chase after that. Listen, you don't have to grab for that. Listen, you don't have to find your completion in that. Why? Because Jesus will be with you always, and he's your helper. He's your provider. He's the one who takes care of you. We shouldn't indulge in actions that betray our ability to project to the world the deep fulfillment that we find in fellowship with Jesus Christ. Listen, I can walk up to you and I could ask you, is Jesus your fulfillment? Is Jesus your provision? Is Jesus your everything? And almost every single Christian you talk to will say, yes, yes, yes. But now the question is, does your life testify to that reality? Does your life prove that reality? Or does the world look at you and think that you find your joy, you find your peace, you find your fulfillment, you find your provision in everything they find it in? You guys understand what I'm saying? The areas expressed here by the author of Hebrews addresses two aspects of us modeling this this beauty work of, of the gospel of Jesus in our lives. The first one is interesting because it speaks about sexual fidelity. It speaks about, it speaks about sexual f- uh, faithfulness. In this case, the, the author points out two examples of sexual sin, both of which are being related to fidelity. The one, uh, both of them are, are related to this idea of faithfulness for the marriage. It talks about, it talks about Id- idolatry. And more generally, it talks about sexual immorality. And I want to explain to you exactly why it plays out that way. You see, see marriage, the the Christian marriage is meant to be a a living picture of the faithful relationship between Jesus Christ and his church. This is really what you see in Ephesians chapter 5. It it, it talks about this and it talks about husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It says wives submit to your husbands. It gets down to the, to the very end of that passage, and it talks about husbands love your wives. It talks about wives respect your husbands. But as you read the layout of Ephesians chapter 5, he's talking about, he's talking about husbands and wives and faithfulness and, 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 and them caring for, for one another and them submitting to one another and them sacrificing for one another. But Jesus says, I'm speaking here of God. I'm speaking here of the mystery of the relationship between Jesus Christ and the church. You read through that passage, and the entire time, Paul is moving in and out of the relationship between Jesus and the church and a husband and a wife. And the reason why he's doing that is because he's saying, I want you to understand, we are modeling, we are creating the picture of the fidelity that Jesus has with the church. And so the author of Hebrews steps into that conversation, and he says, when you are unfaithful, whether it is before you are married or whether it is while you are married, you are betraying the picture of Jesus' faithfulness. You are showing something that you don't believe in. Do you believe in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ? Do you believe in the reality that he is your provision, that he is your fulfillment? The author of Hebrews is bringing this out because he's saying, Listen, when you show that your fulfillment and your completion is in your spouse, in your husband, in your wife, you're modeling the fulfillment that you find solely in your fidelity to Christ. And when you break that, what you're showing everybody in the world is that you believe the same thing they do. That your completion, that your, that your happiness is found in chasing whoever will sleep with you. The second one is, is very much related to that. The second, the second idea is about the love of money. He says, he says in this, he says, listen, do not love money. Be content. The, the idea in that is the same, that, that our satisfaction, that our completion is not in what, what this world has to give us. 
it, 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 would, it is to say that, that the faithful work of Jesus Christ isn't enough. The passage here says, ask, talk, moves on to the, the idea of the love of money and, 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 have, and our discontentment. And it's saying in both of these, we show the world that our hope is not in the provision of God, but it's in the same thing that the godless put their hope in. This isn't to say that we, 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 can't, uh, we can't faithfully work and that we can't receive with gratitude the gifts that come as a result of our labor. But when we are consumed with both the acquisition of wealth and the lack of wealth, to the point that it causes us to lose our joy, to lose our peace, when, when the accumulation of things from our wealth overshadows the use of that wealth for the kingdom of Christ, we are showing the world that we don't believe in the provision and the presence of God in our lives. Because we believe, like they believe, that our hope is in the next hour. I look at, I look at where this goes. Don't give in to sexual sin. Don't be consumed by grabbing for money. Because I am am with you always because I am your helper. I am the one who runs to help you when you cry out. The greatest cause of sin in the life of the believer is the lack of conviction that God is ultimately the source of all that is good. Whether it looks good in the eyes of the world is irrelevant. God has as his heart's desire for his children both our good and his glory. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he's the provider? Do you believe that he's the healer? Do you believe he is the source of all of your joy and all of your peace? Then we need to live that out. We need to step into that life where we have a dependency upon him, where we believe he is our helper, that when we cry out, he will run to us. But we rest in his hand's work in our lives, regardless of the earthly outcome we will find a peace and joy the world can never give you. He is working for you. He loves you. He cares for you. And he wants good for you, and he wants your life to reveal the glory that he he is. I got a graphic example this week of what it means to just entirely drop your faith in the hands of the Father. Just drop your life in the hands of Jesus Christ. It was from, it was from this dear pastor in Rwanda that I got, got to meet, a pastor by the name of Pastor Clement. Pastor Clement came up to me after one of my sessions and thanked me for, profusely for, for, for my message, which is, which is always like incredibly humbling because I stand and I look at these pastors and I just think, what wonderful men of God. And what, why would I stand up here and tell them anything? And so he comes up and Pastor Clement just... Beautiful man, just really tall man, strong man. He comes walking up, and we start talking. He tells me he's 74 years of age. And I looked at him, I said, 74? He said, you look like you're 54. And he says, oh, no. He said, I used, to, I used to be strong. I used to be okay. He said, but I got cancer. And he, had, he had a cane. He's standing with, with a cane. And he said, I got cancer in my hip area. And he said, I went in, and they said the cancer was all, all in my hip and that there really wasn't anything they could do. And so, so he said, we prayed. He said, we prayed. I went back. They did a scan. The cancer's not there anymore. Completely gone. He said, but in the, in the midst of that, the cancer had eaten part of the bones in his hip, and he was in pain. So he went to the doctors, and he said to the doctors, can you, can you do a hip replacement? Can you do anything? And so they scanned his his his, his his pelvic area, and they said, well, the bones that we would need, the bone we would need to attach to has been eaten away by the cancer, and it's not there anymore. So Pastor Clement went to the church, and they began to pray for him. So he picked up the phone, he called the doctors, and he said, we prayed, the the bone is there now. And the doctor said, no, that's not how that works. And he said, we prayed, the bone is there right now, you need to scan it. And he went in, they scanned the area, and the bone was there right now. And they did a hip replacement for him. 
So he told me, he told me that he just had a follow-up visit with the doctors, and the doctors had given him some cancer medicine to take. And, and uh, the, he said, told the doctor, he said, I'm not taking them anymore. The doctor, began to, you know, the doctor began to chide him and began to say, you need to take your medicine, you need to take your medicine. Why would you stop taking your medicine? You take your medicine. And Pastor Clement looked at me and he said, I told him this. I said, you as a doctor, he said, you treat people, right? The doctor said, yes. He said, sometimes you treat these people and they get better and they're healed, right? He said, yeah. And he said, sometimes you treat these people and they die, right? He said, yeah. And he said, we Christians... When someone is sick, we pray, and we pray hard, and we pray with wailing before God, and sometimes God, sometimes God heals them. And he said, sometimes we, when someone is sick, we pray, and we pray hard, and we pray with wailing before our God, and sometimes they die. He said, what's the difference? Now, I'm not saying that we as Christians shouldn't go and receive treatment from doctors. But what I am saying is, we as Christians need to believe that our greatest source of provision is in Jesus Christ. That our greatest source of healing is in Jesus Christ. That our greatest source of completion is in Jesus Christ. That our greatest source of joy is in Jesus Christ. This is not about do's and don'ts. This is about how much you believe the word of God, how much you put your faith in who Jesus is, how much you believe that he is your everything. Because I'm telling you this right now, if you do not believe God is your provision, you will chase after money. If you do not believe that God is your joy, you will chase after women. If you do not believe that God is your completion, you will chase after love with some other guy. The issue is not the do's and don'ts. The issue is whether or not you are fixated on the beautiful work of Jesus Christ in your life. You see, the conclusion of it all, whether we are talking about this morning's text or the book of Hebrews or the embodiment of the Christianity itself, is when we get fixated on the few points of do's and don'ts, we will get lost in a life of religious frustration. But when we fixate like a laser on the vastness of Christ's glorious gospel work, we will be surprised by the life of joy and peace and hope and love that waits for us. Stop trying harder. And start embracing, start fixating on the great love of Christ towards you as expressed by his gospel work, distilled in his death on the cross. And you will be amazed how you are changed, how the life you live changes, how your priorities change. Abide in his word. Fellowship with Christians who will teach you and model for you the love of Jesus. Purpose to find times of prayer. Aim not by at receiving from the hand of Christ, but at seeing the face of Christ. Don't miss the forest for the trees. Don't think your Christian faith is about do's and don'ts of religiosity. When it is about the majestic reality that Jesus is worth all that we offer up to him. Because he's given it back to us abundantly, pressed down, shaken together and running over. The new covenant gospel work of Jesus Christ is not only superior to the old covenant, it is superior to everything the world has to offer. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. When this grips your spirit and soul, your life will reveal it.